very good afternoon and uh, would like to congratulate the team which is uh, organizing this uh, techni it's a great uh, feeling to have uh, seen some of the good innovations done by young and the middle aged and the college students being in iit guwahati i feel very happy because it was about 5 to 6 years back when i came here and visited the biotechnology department and the department of mechanical engineering i was that day itself uh, impressed by the kind of work which is being done in this institution so when this offer came that i should talk to you i thought the best way to interact with you is to give the glimpses of what the country needs and uh, how the technology emerging is emerging and that uh, how this technology can be made use of for meeting the needs of the nation humanity as a whole and uh, as all of you know the engineering is the technology is going through transformation what used to be once upon a time in stand alone system today it's a convergence these are the days of convergence and diversity and convergence are the two bug words uh, which are actually taking us from what we were about 100 years back and what we would be in the next 50 years to come so my topic is that we talk about the frontiers of engineering and uh, we would like to share with you uh, some of the civilian aspects and also a bit of uh, what the army and the air force and the navy would be needing or doing based upon the technologies what uh, are emerging today all of you know that we live in a world shaped by engineering we know whatever is happening around us whatever comforts we have uh, we are making use of are the fruits of engineering and uh, it has brought us uh, all kinds of comforts it has made ha people happy it has made people safe and also it's a symbol of progress so uh, as somebody said it surrounds us it connects human society and engineering creativity that designs the world we want and turns ideas into reality basically it is the overlap of the scientific knowledge with the technical uh, with the societal needs and application of scientific knowledge to the needs of the society and this is one thing which i would like to mention to you that when i joined uh, uh, niti aayog within about 3 months uh, our honorable prime minister had a meeting with the large number of very senior scientists of this country and uh, there was professors from iits there were academicians from other institutions there were scientists from national laboratories and only one message he delivered on that day he said uh, for the last about 70 years of independence i have seen a uh, seen the growth of or i mean in this case i am quoting prime minister i have seen the growth of uh, uh, science in a individualistic manner there are very very acclaimed scientists who have made name name uh, worldwide they have done wonderful work but i would like you to now start doing work for the society that means he focused uh, focused on uh, gave a focus that we should go to translational research do more and more innovation commercialization and bring sucker be a sucker or be a relief mechanism as far as the country's needs are concerned so this is what the definition and this is what the world has done so far it is also seen that over the centuries right from the 5000 bc till today when we grew up from stone age to the bronze age to the iron age then chemical age and plastic age and today we are in an age of information knowledge and technology uh, we have really uh made wonderful progress the society as a whole the human beings as a whole and uh, it used to be an agri society today we are an industrial society and we are also graduating into an information and knowledge society now you have seen things right in front of you those of you have visited some of the things which were which were which were realized in in say 912 bc they still exist and now tipu's rockets what you have seen which came up uh, in 1792 and then we had the industrial revolution which stays a complete technological scenario as far as the world is concerned which brought in certain amount of uh, human labor getting converted through machines and machines converting into uh, into mechanisms which are going to be more and more efficient and hence the technology became the building block for the happiness of the nation of the world as a whole now from there 
we got into nuclear energy, we got into today DNA and we have got carbon nanotubes coming in and today we have revolution in the HMI through molecular nanotechnology. I saw some wonderful work being done in this area on biomolecular uh, subjects. So basically it is an emergence of smart and intelligent systems and materials which is taking place in the 21st century. It is technology of nano age which is driving the entire thing. So this transformation which has taken place over the last uh, may, may we say thousand years and uh, what we can reckon with and uh, that is what is going to now pave, or pave way for the next generation of things which will happen. The, we have seen in India in just last about 70 years since independence I am quoting what has India achieved. You know white revolution, you know Dr. Kurian who was responsible for it and that is why we are the largest first nation in the world, well, first country in the world which is doing the largest production of the milk products. We had our green revolution which is responsible for today's uh, food needs of the country to the extent that we have surplus food uh, stocks, stocks today and that was the first green revolution. Person who was responsible was Ms. Swaminathan. You have a huge ICT scenario, the information communication technology scenario. Dr. Kalam's uh, space and, uh, and uh, defense ventures have led to satellites, missiles, armaments and variety of missions including Chandrayaan and uh, Mangalyaan and all that. The, we today have an indigenous aircraft carrier. Today we have indigenous submarine INS Arihan. Today we have nuclear power plants in the country and uh, we have huge railway networks which is available. So you see the way the technological growth has taken place in the country take, making use of what has happened across the world during the second, uh, during the industrial revolution and doing our own value addition ensuring that we have a um, certain amount of self-sufficiency as far as these things are concerned. And uh, generally on the earth, the engineering contributions are on the earth, water, air, plants and animals. All of them have either in the form of dams or in the form of river control or in the aircrafts or helicopters or windmills or the agriculture methods. Basically, they are responsible for the, the, the growth of mankind's uh, uh, requirements and the needs being fulfilled. Indian engineering for the changing society. There are success stories as I mentioned to you across agriculture, telecom, ICT, space, defense, pharma and uh, today we have the biggest advantage, we call it 3D advantage and I saw the 3D advantage today when I saw the youngsters doing wonderful work. We are the largest democracy, that is the first D. We have a demographic dividend because our 60% of the population is in the range age bracket of about 24 to 35 years. Uh, which has got strong domestic demand because we are large number 1.3 billion people. So domestic demand is that these three D's are going to drive what we call as the major um, uh, strength or what, what are the major market demand which will come on. Now in this process we have uh, researchers which are deploying technologies emanating from applied research areas such as bio-inspired engineering, biomimicking, brain machine interface to critical areas like health and hygiene and food and agriculture. These are the new disciplines which are actually changing the scenario altogether. But in spite of all that today we need to really direct our energies to solve the problem of poverty because one fourth of our Indian population is under the uh, below the poverty line and 70 percent of them live in the rural areas. Women population is also about 46 percent. Now in this case empowerment of women taking care of people at the bottom of the pyramid and bringing succor to the people who really need uh, things and hence we have to do what we call a strive for I mentioned in the inaugural also innovation and solutions that are pro-poor and address the needs of the society at the bottom of the pyramid. That is what we need. Now where do we stand? As a nation who has been now in independent for last 70 plus years, uh, where do we stand with respect to the global uh, comparisons? India ranks 40 in travel and tourism competitive index out of 136 countries. India ranks 60th. In, in the inclusive development index. These are all numbers which will tell you where do you stand with respect to each of these factors. 87 among the 127 countries in the energy architecture performance index. Then we rank 20th out of 58 in the climate change performance index. 
We ranked 92 in the global index of talent competitiveness, INSEED as we call it. India ranks 143rd in the economic freedom index out of the 186 countries. India ranks 43rd among the 45 nations in international intellectual property index. That means how many of us are in a position to get the real IPs. Ninth in the bribery and corruption in business. That's the only area where we are up in within 10. India ranks 79 out of the 176 countries in corruption perception index for the year 2016. 131 in the two, in uh, 2016 on what we call as the human development index and that's one of the very important parameters because that gives you a real picture of how in terms of education health employment and other aspects how we have developed in, in development index so you see where do we go where do we stand in this as a result with this kind of our standing today we have a major journey to perform and we have problems in front of us. We have commitments which we have made on the international platforms like COP21. So that is where who will solve the big problems. Now that's where we are in IITs, we are, in, we are among the youngsters. And the problems are, for example, sustainable development and climate change. We have a requirement of clean water. I saw some kids doing some wonderful work in cleaning uh, technologies for cleaning water and so on. Population and resources. We are ever increasing population. We have to match the resources with the population demands and so on. We have a situation where we are a democratic country where democratization is a major issue. But democracy with accountability and responsibility is what is to be, what to be imbibed in. Not democracy with purely with respect to what is uh, you know, thought of as freedom to speak and freedom to act. Global foresight in decision making. While we are making decisions, it is important for us to take what the global needs are there. We just saw the indices which I mentioned to you. They are also indications of where do we spend, uh, stand globally. So when we make decisions, global indices, global foresight has to be uh, kept in front of us. Global convergence of IT, rich poor gap has to be filled. There are large number of health issues that are uh, you know what is our um, um, maternity rate and what is our uh, nutrition rate. We know about every 40, about 44 children out of 1000 are malnutrition. That is a kind of number. So we have huge health issues. We have education issues because in spite of the fact that we have some of the best policies to promote education, we still have people, dropout rates are how GER are not very good. So these are the issues to be handled. We have our own problems of peace and conflict, internal as well as external. Status of women, our Honorable Prime Minister has been literally fighting for it that we empower our women and give them equal status, if not better, as far as the society is concerned. Transformational organizational crime, you know, transnational you know, organized crime, this is another problem. Energy needs, because energy is one indicator which gives you an indication of what is the growth of the nation, what is the development indices. For example, a developed nation will consume something like 5,000 to 5,500 kilowatt hours per person per year. Whereas in India, we are still at about 1,075 uh, kilowatt hours per person per year. So that is a kind of difference. That also shows the, shows the difference in the development activities. Science and technology is a major, uh, major indication, major actually vehicle for growth and hence that has to be, uh, that has to be taken forward. Uh, one thing which we, we, we saw corruption indices and all says global ethics is what is another problem which we have to bear with. Now all this can be solved by to graduates who are highly creative with bright ideas and that's why this slide for all of you. These are the challenges which we need to really take into account. Now, as the technology is going to come, the future dangers are worse than the most optimist indicate. There could be things, while we have nanoparticles, we have nanotechnologies, but there are issues with nano. There are, while we have got, um, um, you know, tissues which can be, uh, sorry, organs which can be artificially uh, built, but there are issues for them. For example, advanced technologies could lead to global long-term structural unemployment. We are all saying artificial intelligence, uh, automation, robotics, and self-driving cars and so on and so forth. But all this will lead to what amount of ind industry 4.0. Is it going to take away the work of a large number of artisans and masons who are really working in the industrial area? Has anybody thought? One analysis which has been done by the uh, FIKI, which says that 
if we employ industry 4.0, 69% unemployment will come up. Of course, I don't agree with that number because I personally believe that it won't be unemployment, but it will be basically a different kind of a job profile that will emerge. And hence, we have to actually skill our people to meet those requirements. Individual could only one day make and deploy weapons of mass destruction. Today, nuclear technology is so well known. Artificial intelligence could evolve beyond our control in a destructive fashion. Uh, we can read the mind of the people. The cognition is going to be so strong that uh, we can use that information for destructive purpose. Proliferation of advanced destructive weapons among the hate groups. Long-term effects of global warming. Organized crime lead to the world like Central America condition, all this. Urban infrastructures may become too complex to manage, maintain and prevent sabotage. It is already happening. You see the major metropolitan cities today, the urban infrastructure has become so complex that managing it both in terms of human population, movement, pollution, energy needs, food supplies, all that is becoming very, very complex. And as the numbers are increasing, urbanization is growing. As I speak to you for one minute, 33 people walk into a city like Delhi in one minute as we discuss from the rural areas to urban areas. If that is the rate at which 50% of the population of India will live by 2035 or 50 uh, in the city areas. Somebody says that urbanization is the indication of uh, growth because it's true also because if you see the contribution of the urban population versus the rural population, 33% population which lives in the urban areas contribute 66% to the um, GDP growth and whereas the balance is from the rural areas. So that is an indication of growth also. But then you have issues of urbanization. Large enough asteroid could hit the earth and cause nuclear winter. Doomsday scenarios of nuclear proliferation are possible. These are some of the things. So the greatest challenge as far as the 21st century engineering is concerned is global sustainability. We need to ensure that we are taking care of all the three pillars of sustainability, namely the social pillar, the economic pillar, and the environmental pillar. Unless we take care of that and every decision which we take passes through the lens of sustainability, we will not be doing justice as an engineer. And that's why today if you look at, to meet the sustainability goals, which many of you might have studied both with respect to poverty, uh, hunger, health, quality of education, gender, um, you know, variety, these 17 uh, numbers are there, all of you must have read that. If we had to meet all that, we had to change our system. And that system is global system, uh, social system, and human system. Global system means climate, resource, energy, ecosystem will lead to global sustainability. Global warming uh, will certainly, uh, if it is there, then we have to go for low carbon society. Mass production, consumption and destruction, if we go away from that, we will get sustainable production and consumption. And poverty, natural disasters and infectious diseases, if we can get rid of, then we get a human security. Now, all this has to be done as part of the sustainability development program. For that, the engineering has to transform itself. Why I am giving this uh, indication? Because uh, whatever we are doing today, or the people of my generation have done. We have concentrated on traditional engineering practice in which we consider only an object and we design an object, make it useful, and that's the end of it. Whereas today's engineer has to consider a complete system in which the object will be used. We used to focus on technical issues. We never bothered about social issues, non-technical issues. But today we have to integrate any engineering decision. It has to integrate technical and non-technical. We used to solve immediate problem. There is a requirement for a bridge to be laid, we'll sell the bridge. No. We had to solve the problem for indefinite future, forever. We should ensure that the problem completely disappears. Consider the local context. We have always bothered about what happens in with the vicinity. But we have to look at a planet as a whole. If what I am doing today in the city of Guwahati, if it has impact on somewhere else, then we have to be worried about. Assumes others will deal with politics, ethics, and social issues. We never bothered about it. That was a good interlude. Let's go from what we were discussing, the sustainability that is essential for uh, tomorrow's uh, survival. That means basically we are looking for leaving this planet for the future generations, and engineering has to play a major role. And that's why future manufacturing will be uh, whether you look for uh, cleaner, advanced materials, manufacturing technologies to grow India's future productivity. 
Then we have food futures where we have uh, flagship will transform the agri-food sector of the nation through new technologies. I don't know how many of you have ever studied what did the first green revolution do. While we have a high productivity in the first green revolution, but there are negative impacts of that in terms of excessive use of the groundwater, excessive use of pesticides and also the, also the fertilizers, leading to the soil becoming non-usable and so on. And there are issues with respect to pollution of water. Biosecurity is a major requirement where threats and risks posed by the serious exotic and endemic pests. Preventive health, as I mentioned to you, uh, we, are, we are a society where we have uh, maternity, uh, mother's uh, survival rate, children's problem, nutrition, all of them. We have sustainable agriculture, which are, we have to reduce the carbon footprint. So that has to be done as part of the global water for healthy country. Water is going to be the mixed major problem in the nation. So we have to look for sustainable management of India's water resources. Climate adaptation, as all of you know, we have signed COP21 and where we have said that we will reduce our emissions to a large extent, 30% reduction by 2030 or something, which is a major uh, commitment we have made. So we have to bring that part. Wealth from oceans, that is one area where we have not done enough. We have huge wealth available in the oceans and uh, we have not exploited. So science and technology has to look at that. Enduring social, environment, and economic wealth from the vast ocean territory. Energy transform. We are getting into renewable energy in a big way today. We have uh, known goals, 175 gigawatts and so on. Solar and um, renewables and things like that, which have to be done. Minerals also, delivering science and technology solutions to the Indian mineral industry. And as I was mentioning to you, we have to take care of our people at the bottom of the pyramid, which is the user community pyramid shown here in the bottom. And right from the sea, land, river, information collection about all of them, remote sensing through satellites, GPS through navigation, data center and cloud computing and network, all put together to make sure that the geospatial technologies are harnessed to bring sustainable development for rural areas, urban areas, fishing community, farmers, industry, and the government. That is the demand. That's why those who are in the manufacturing today, the transformation would be from what you are having traditional manufacturing where you used to do manufacturing through substitution. Then we turn to lean manufacturing where our focus was waste reduction. Then we turn into green manufacturing where we were combining that ensuring that the energy uh, is minimized, economically used, and envi environmentally benign. We used to call it 3R based approach in those days. And now we have gone into sustainable manufacturing, which will be innovative. And it has got what we call as a 6R culture. culture. What is the 6R there? Remanufacture, redesign, recover, recycle, reuse, and reduce. This is the kind of cycle. And it will also lead to what we normally talk these days, circular economy. And uh, that will meet the requirement by 2050 that we have minimum wastage. Minimum utilization of resources for meeting all the demands of the nation. And that is the sustainable manufacturing which we are talking of. So, in terms of challenges, as others see, grand challenges for engineering are make solar energy economical. It's already happening today, but it is happening at what the Chinese are able to do. We are able to make our solar energy cheaper because we have cheaper solar cells available from China. We have not done enough ourselves to make sure that our solar cells are quality and quantity and cost-wise competitive. Provide energy from fusion. This is one area we have neglected. Develop carbon sequestration methods to reduce the carbon footprint. Manage the nitrogen cycle better for better productivity. Provide access to clean water. Restore and improve urban infrastructure. Advance health informatics because unless we are able to get the entire information about what is happening to each and every child in the village, to a mother who is pregnant, to a guy who is old, we will not be able to provide the health system as far as the nation is concerned. Engineer better medicines, reverse engineer the brain. This is another challenge. Prevent nuclear terror, secure cyberspace. This is another area which needs our immediate attention. Enhance virtual reality and advance personalizing the learning should be personalized. Engineer the tools of scientific discovery. If we do that, then the right side what is given is the millennium development goals, which have today become the sustainability development goals, will get, uh, uh, you know, solved, which will be able to reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, 
combat diseases like HIV, AIDS, malaria and others, ensure environmental sustainability. All this will happen. Biology and engineering can effectively address these challenges and create significant societal impact. And that's what is happening. Where are you with respect to innovation today? We are in the sixth wave of innovation. Because the first wave starting from 1785 to the wave in which all of us have lived through is the petrochemical and electronics. That was the fourth wave, which we have seen it growing. Overuse of uh, crude even today happens. Then we have seen between 80s and today the digital network, biotechnology, software, information technology. But what is happening today is sustainability, radical resource productivity, uh, whole system design, biomimicry, green chemistry, industrial ecology, renewable energy, and green nanotechnology. This is what the innovation wave is driving today. And for that innovation wave, the technologies which are coming up which are, we call them as the transformer or disruptive or transformative technologies because they are significant, they make potential for significant systematic, economic and political impact by boosting industry productivity and competitiveness. They enable us to uh, address long-standing problems and global challenges and uh, have the potential to create new industries and manufacturing opportunities, can provide sustainable, high-quality, high-wage jobs. And these technologies, many of you have already started using them. ICT is well known, which is really going to transform the entire uh, situation. Biotechnology, nanotechnology, genomics, microelectronics, advanced materials, and remote sensing, GIS using 3D LIDAR, high performance computing and analytics, instrumentation and control, mathematical modeling, isotope marking, 3D printing, additive manufacturing. Some of them only I've listed, the list is pretty large. Nanotechnology, which is really making the difference, the grand challenges by the foundation, Science Foundation has identified is nanostructured material by design. The ability to measure, control and restructure matter at the nanoscale in order to change those properties and functions as we need. Nanoscale electronics, smaller, faster, cheaper computers and electronics. Nanomanufacturing, nanotechnologies to improve the environment and nanotechnology to improve the healthcare, where nanotech-inspired medicines and treatments are there. In fact, I was discussing in the morning with your director, sir, where he was telling me how uh, the drug can reach at the right place in the right quantity using the nano uh, particles and the methods of microfluidics and so on. Very important. Future technologies where the synergies are taking place, synthetic biology, robotic manufacturing, quantum computing, drones, robotic manufacturing, 3D, 4D printing, Augmented reality, telepresence, nanotechnology, tele everything, tele every day and tele every, tele everybody. This is the kind of thinking. Artificial intelligence, and this is not just artificial intelligence. Now it is getting a different name. Artificial general intelligence and uh, increasing individual and collective intelligence levels. Now all these technologies have to work in a synergistic mode to solve the problems. And that is where the technology change is taking place. Bioengineering is one thing which is really important because it is bringing everything together. For example, in a bioengineering, you have chemical engineering, you have mechanical engineering, material science and engineering, electrical engineering, physics, chemistry and biochemistry, biology and neurobiology, computer science and engineering, all put together to meet the requirements of food, agriculture, healthcare, clothing, aerospace, shelter, energy and chemical. All this is part of the bio, highly interdisciplinary this science is becoming. And that's why it is becoming more and more important that engineers have to learn biology in a big way. I hope IIT Guwahati is also running some courses of uh, um, you know, biology for the engineers in some way. I saw it is happening in IIT Delhi. I hope you are also doing. Bio-inspired engineering is, addresses the unmet challenges making a difference to the world. Uh, richly collaborative and in, 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 smart uh, therapies, biocompatible implants, 3D printed organs, engineered heart cells and so on. This is all becoming part of that. And also most important thing which is coming out is the biosensors. And today in the smart systems, biosensors are going to play a major role. We have a major demand. With, I mentioned to you about how to reduce the cost of energy, particularly solar energy, which is dependent on what is the cost of the solar cell. It has been tremendous activity throughout the last about two decades when people have been working on reducing the cost of solar power and started with organic solar, quantum dot, then you have concentrators, amorphous silicon, cadmium telluride, then 
polycrystalline, multicrystalline, monocrystalline cells, all of them. The goal post is that we should be somewhere close to about 0.2 to 0.1 uh, or 0.2 dollars per unit, that kind of a thing. Greatest cost reduction is expected. That will happen only if we have highly efficient systems. So multi-junction solar cells are what people have been working on, which requires tremendous amount of R&D even today. The left hand side here you can see there is already a combination in multi-junction solar cells where you have gallium and, 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 and nimai and phosphide and uh, gallium arsenide and germanium which gives you an efficiency of 38.7. There are, there are uh, combinations which will give you 42, there are other combinations which will can give you as high as 43.5 gallium, indium. Um, and uh, arsenic, antimonide, all this can, some of these new combinations can give. There's a lot of work which is going on abroad. I have visited number of IITs, number of NITs, number of places, but unfortunately, group three, five materials, not much work in India has been taken up. I would certainly like to know if somebody is really doing good work here because the, we know that theoretically you can get as high as 45% efficiency, but to get the process of manufacturing in such a manner, because this is not the same process as we have in the photovoltaic cells today. This is a different process where you have molecular epitaxy and things like that. But uh, this should also bring down the cost. This is a major area. Another major requirement is hydrogen economy. Hydrogen economy is what we have to see as far as the energy is concerned. And it would need how do you extract hydrogen efficiently, how do you store hydrogen efficiently and how do you transport hydrogen efficiently. And then you have a fuel cell which is cheaper compared to the today's IC engines. That means I should be able to produce hydrogen using, using coal, nuclear energy, solar, wind, thermal and all that. That, elect, that, that uh, electricity heat which decomposes, electrolyzes uh, water to give hydrogen and then I should combust the hydrogen to give um, either a hydrogen engine or I use it in the fuel cell to generate electricity. The advantage is that you have only water vapor as the effluent. Now what is the situation with respect to hydrogen? Whatever research has been done so far, if you see the current technology for automotive applications, what is the current gravimetric energy density that is a millijoules per kg system? At the left hand corner you see all of them piling up their chemical hydride, compressed gas, hydrogen and so on. Liquid hydrogen is also very close to that. And uh, you see the right hand, rightmost corner, the gasoline which is sitting there which is the today's fuel. We are nowhere near what the gasoline can do. So unless we are able to get freedom what we call as 4.58% of hydrogen by 2005, that was the goal set in 2002, to 9% weight hydrogen by 2015, we are nowhere near even then. So there is a huge research requirement for hydrogen storage. Same thing is going to happen in the areas of CMOS, which is a communication technology which is becoming, you have seen the 28 FD, you have got 14 FD, you have got 10 FD. And uh, in 2009, we were all talking about 28 nanometer, but today we are all in five nanometer, seven nanometer. And 2025, you will have single electron transistor, 2D materials, neuromorphic architectures, and uh, big work which is going on in quantum computing. So these are disruptive scaling technologies which are coming up today and uh, memories are getting 3D and so on. So this is one area which needs our attention. Group 3-5 transistors is another area which will be needing our attention rather than continuing with the silicon. So this is the advanced CMOS red uh, roadmap which we have. The main thing which is going to happen is the microelectronics getting integrated with the photonics. And this diagram shows you how an array uh, LD or memory or a many core CPU with a silicon optical interposer can have a silicon modulator, photo detector, waveguide, PCB or a BGA which can be attached to that. The idea is that you have processor interconnection, multi-core to many core, memory interconnection which is flat memory to 3D memory. We have a storage interconnection with SGD to 3D SGD. Peripheral interconnections, HDMI to super uh, high vision, and uh, server interactions, which is exascale computing. This is what is going to happen. And you can see on the left hand side, you have the complete on a two inch with a mic with a photonics layer. The three types of layered sandwich structures are feasible for the implementation of integration of photonics and electronic circuits. Front end integration, back end integration, and flip chip bonding. The first two are 
monolithic integrators and the third is a hybrid integration. I have been trying to propose this kind of a work in many of the institutions today because I personally believe that the distinct advantage which is there in this has to be taped if we have to really go for hexascale computing and so on, which is the major requirement for HPC today. We saw evolution of teraflop computers between 1999 to 2009. 10 to 20 is a technology change leading to the X, uh, flop uh, computing. So we have large scale hybrid ar architectures which may evolve further. But power consumption is a major issue even today. We need megawatts of uh, power for doing excess scale computing. So we need power efficient processing cores, optical system interconnect as I mentioned to you, efficient interconnection topology, nano scale memories and highly scalable programming environment and parallel libraries that is the requirement for the high performance computing i am also looking after this as a chairman of the empowered committee for high performance computing program of the department of science and technology and um, the the mighty uh, we are struggling to get that we can have some of these technologies done in our country otherwise most of it is imported uh, you see this you optically interconnected system. You have an integrated silicon photonics processor. Then there's a multi-chip module. Then there's a board, an array of boards putting in a rack and you create a data center. Now you see the size difference. A shipping container will have a big data application, a pair of photonic computer which come in a suitcase size. The difference will be weight will be in the case of photonics VCM2 it will be 19 so sorry yeah almost about 19 kg whereas IBM pucks cost uh, weighs about 6000 uh, kgs so that is the kind of difference power consumption will come down to 5 as against 902 kilowatts so this is the kind of change that can take place if we really go into this the future technologies which are coming in this areas are tunnel buff, uh, fats graphene pn junctions Orbitronic, domain wall logic, spin fat, spintronic, majority, spin wave devices. I feel these are the technologies which are going to drive tomorrow. And uh, if we have to really go into the, the next generation of uh, microelectronics to solve the problem. Quantum computing is one area. We have a quantum annealer, three uh, systems are there. It's, annealer does not give you any great advantage because it, the speed wise is almost the same. Whereas quantum analog computing, likely form of quantum computing that will first show the quantum speed up over the conventional computing. Here you have almost about 100 qubits, that is the kind of configuration you have. And uh, generally it is, uh, you know, it is, it is, it is uh, power wise it consumes high power. But the third one is the universal computing where you will have almost about 10,000 qubits kind of a thing. True grand challenge in computing areas with the potential to be exponentially faster than the traditional computer for a number of important applications and that is what we need to develop. The world is going to see IoT explosion in a big way. All of you know this IoT, we will skip that. So applications which are really going to be affected by IoT are home building, transportation, logistics, smart industries, small retail, smart environment. Precision agriculture, health, some of the projects which some of the boys and girls have shown are certainly useful precision agriculture where you can deliver the right amount of moisture, the right amount of fertilizer and uh, seeding and cutting and so on. Uh, all this is feasible today. For example, in transportation you can do with IoT traffic management, congestion control, connected cars, smart roads and so on. In the case of home and building you can do monitoring and control of internal building environment. In the case of health certainly you can do uh, monitoring of the medical um, health of the system and so on. Uh, so the internet of things is going to drive the entire scenario in future and that's why cyber physical systems are becoming more and more important but even in the cyber systems physical was a steam engine today's systems what we saw are the telecommunication computers internet but physical and digital context, cognitive revolution is going to take place with augmented reality, virtual reality and service robots, IoT, 3D printing and even 4D printing is coming up now. So we have uh, smartness coming in everywhere. You will have smart cities and smart cities means they will be leading to intelligent nation. While smart cities means smart business, smart environment, smart mobility, smart utility, smart infrastructure, smart government smart citizens and smart education. All of them are part of the smart uh, and intelligent uh, 
technology scenario. The thing which is going to change the complete communication scenario in the next five years, and it's already happening in many cases, is the 5G. 5G is going to drive the entire process. For example, if you take uh, the advantages, ultra low com complexity, tens of bits per second, ultra high density, one million nodes per kilometer square, extreme capacity, 10 terabytes per kilometer square, extreme data rates where multi GBPS peak rates of 100 plus Mbps user experimental rates can, ultra high reliability, that is what is going to 5G's revolution, one out of 100 million packets will be lost, ultra low latency as low as one uh, millisecond, and strong security in terms of uh, all the requirements with the, uh, the, and particularly in the health area, education area, financial securities and so on. So mission critical control, massive internet of things and enhanced mobile broadband is what the 5G is going to bring. So there's a need for us to get more and more technologies developed in-house in the country on the 5G area. Another one is the intelligent grids. We just saw power failure. Now, integrated and intelligent electricity system of the future, where you have storage devices like pump hydro, compressed air, batteries, and so on. We have smart transmission and distribution networks. We have smart energy control systems and smart users like the like the you know uh, local grids and the micro grids which are formed due to rooftop solar or the roof wind, local wind, and so on. All put together on a distributed energy resource management system. To integrate all elements of electricity system will increase complexity but improve operations, efficiency and resilience while optimizing energy resource and investment. Recently only we had a workshop on this smart grids and we found that India if it has to look at smart grids both AC and DC, we have to make a lot of technological change with respect to the power electronics, with respect to our distribution sensors and with respect to our computer data analytics and big data. Uh, approach. We have to do that. And that's where big data analytics comes because that is going to drive clean energy, advanced manufacturing, everywhere. Big data analytics is going to be the major requirement as far as smart and intelligent systems are concerned. Whether they are sustainable energy or microelectronics, data is going to be responsible for improving each one of them. Clusters benefiting due to big data are all given in this. They are in the red <laughs> indicated here. So big data analysis, big data mining, data analytics are the important areas which all of us have to work for. 2025 will see robots have entered our homes for personal use. Sensor de uh, sensory uh, devices guide our everyday lives. And mobile financial transactions are now in cryptocurrencies. It's likely to happen. There are 6 million autonomous cars in Europe and North America. This is what the prediction is. Big data has entered the gigabyte era. The 3D and 4D printing is gaining mainstream acceptance. High speed rail to connect from China to Europe. And summer, uh, say, low cost holidays in space. That is going to be something which is, uh, uh, which is predicted by 2025 due to the frontiers of technologies which are evolving today. A few things I would like to show on the defense. Because I am a defense guy, you have to certainly know what the technologies are going to do as far as defense is concerned. The warfare is going to change. We are going to change into what is called non-contact warfare. Because we have today information domain, where we collect information, we have cognitive and the social domain, and we have physical domain, which controls the, 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 the weapons and so on. And all that are on a network. So that's why it is called network-centric warfare these days. When we have uh, the disruptive technologies to create theater and battle space, what are those? Like cyber warfare, it is disruptive. Anti-satellite weapons, underwater warfare. I saw some underwater ROVs being done by the kids here. Directed energy weapons, and that is what's more important. Directed energy weapons means I don't come in contact. I send a particle beam, a laser beam, and finish off the enemy's objects. So contactless wars, missile warfare, submarine warfare, directed energy weapons, and space control weapons. The satellites, what I have, may be carrying the weapons and they may be carrying certain things which are not, not good for us. So we have major issues as far as it's concerned. So this is a new warfare perspective which is emerging. What is emerging is that you have laser weapons. Weapons which can be carried, the laser beams, which uh, laser uh, power uh, sources which can be car carried on platforms like ship, 
like like the electron laser or for example you have the uh, you know uh, high energy laser sitting on an aircraft or full capacity fighter carrying a high energy laser and beaming from there you must have read about the sdi program of the united states of america which was in the early 80s where they were trying to have from satellite the laser beams beaming down and killing the the the, the objects on earth it did not uh, become so successful because of the at that point in time the physics was not so well understood particularly the interaction of the laser with the atmosphere and uh, so on but the offshoot of that was that whatever could be done on air, airborne platforms has been developed um, people have understood what are the aero effects flight all that has been done self defense with uh, this kind of laser capabilities have been done so laser system ascent uh, and discipline is a major technology requirement in which laser control uh, laser source first now if i have a chemical laser which runs which occupies a full room it is of no use to me so i need to have what is called uh, the the uh, the fiber optic laser or a disk laser or or a laser which is going to be uh, occupying smaller space but can uh, create, uh, produce almost 100 kilowatts to 500 kilowatts of power another important requirement for a laser beam uh, laser is the beam control when it goes into a particular direction it has a diffraction problem it has the diffusion problem so need, we need to do beam control then we should be able to acquire and track the target and then do power management and thermal management and we should also know what is the interaction of the laser beam with the material of the target will it going what kind of physical interaction is taking place so that requires again material laser interaction physics that has to be understood so these are some of the major technology areas which needs to be really worked upon to make laser weapons for our armed forces one of the typical examples which the americans have done this is a slide for high energy laser which was put on uh, boeing aircraft from where you can have airborne laser this is the same exercise they did for a space based laser or advanced tactical laser ground based laser where basically there is a laser source which is being collimated in that direction there is a radar kind of a device which acquires the target and then this laser beam is directed towards this you can see the there is a sensor suite there is a optical bench there is a beam director and the interaction with the target now this is what we need to do as far as our air force and army or navy is concerned there are another kind of a weapon technology which is called electromagnetic pulse emp pulse when a nuclear explosion takes place you have a emp now this emp i can't produce only by nuclear so i should produce it using high power microwaves and high power weapon technology is based on pulse power devices which create intense ultra short burst of electrical energy uh, and would be used to power the microwave generator in the hpm weapon basically it is called a e bomb where you do this uh, kind of a thing by explosively pumped a uh, flux compression generator and uh, this uses a chemical explosive to uh, compress an electrical charge coil through that i am able to generate that pump but i merely generating a wave is not enough i should be able to direct so you need a director you need an antenna and through that you should be able to pass it on in the direction of the target so that's the technology people have already done uh, significant amount of work in this direction in india also we need to do something to meet the requirements i saw some of the robots which have been done today in the in the exhibition but what is happening in tomorrow's soldiers will be like a predator remotely control reconnaissance and fight a drone which has ability to uh, you know drop things or get thing this was used in iraq was swords miniature combat robots which is equipped with cameras and a machine gun and runs on a caterpillar tracks this is another thing you have uh, similarly uh, a gladiator combat robot which is the modular uh, allow it to be fitted with the mission specific payloads of the future this is a kind of a thing then you have unmanned uh, fire scout helicopter you have micro air vehicles you have unmanned uh, stealth aircrafts and you have big dog walking robot which will be able to carry all sorts of load in fact there our own care and others have already developed what is called a robotic mule the miniaturization is taking place to such an extent that there is a nano spy for reconnaissance it contains nano batteries motors and communication systems as well as the video camera payload and almost like a fly can climb and descend vertically maneuvers using its flapping wings for propulsion and attitude control 
and could be deployed to perform reconnaissance, surveillance, and urban environment. The specifications which have been realized already are 16 centimeter wingspan. The weight is only about 19 grams and speed it can have is almost about 17 kilometers per hour and have a three axis stabilization system. This is a nano spyware. Soldier is also becoming going to be smart. It is not going to remain a soldier as we have today, which is in terms of its, its uniform will give him the weather protection. It will have a stealth uh, characteristics, can heal them, shield them and protect them against chemical and biological warfare. Uh, lethality, it should be able to have possibilities of target detection and recognition. Identification of friendly and foe, who is friendly and who is uh, not so friendly. And it should be able to do its own target designation. He should have something which I should be able to use a laser beam or a laser range finder or something which will illuminate the target and I can hit them in the night. Survivability, certainly we need uh, to survive, that is production system, ballistic materials, adaptive materials. The communication network is very important today, C4I, the command control communication, computer recognizance and intelligence, all that put together. He should have a wrist computer, he should have a communicator on his body, he should be able to have a navigation device of its own, he, know, he knows his position in real time. Not only that, to his platoon commander he should be able to talk on real time. So mobility, energy, he should have, he should be able to generate power itself. So this is the kind of thing which a soldier as a system we have to provide through the technology which is emerging. And robots will be the fighting units tomorrow. So it's a gun mounted robo or a smart surface mine robo or a UAV or a communication leader. All this will be, uh, the, we call them a swarm of robots which will be doing multiple functions, uh, ground holding, offensive, urban warfare. So they can carry guns, they can carry cameras, they can carry bombs, anything they can have, or even they can have a sniper uh, required for fighting uh, with each other. What is important? Important to her, how a swarm of robots will work in a synergistic manner to optimally, uh, to optimize its path of uh, approach to defeat a particular target. That means a lot of descriptive kind of software which needs to be developed in today's parlance using artificial intelligence, behavioral pattern and so on to make sure that it is a highly intelligent scenario which will drive the efficiency of the system. Space wars are going to be important. You saw that satellite one boy was doing today. Uh, we need that we have sensors in the in the in the spy in the in the sky which will monitor what is happening on the ground or in the air so constellation of ir sensing satellites in geo and leo we need early warning of the supposed launch is taking place or, a, or a enemy missile is taking if i have a geo satellite looking into this the moment I, a plume comes out my ir sensor will pick it up and give me information that from this particular source a missile has taken off Act then I should be able to take care of these kind of missiles which are coming in exo-atmosphere and endo-atmospheric. So need kill vehicles which can be launched using missiles and so on. So this is another technology which needs to be done. As we are going to space, you already heard Mr. Trump talking about creating a space force. Now why he is talking of uh, space force has to be done? Because there is going to be conflict in that space. For why? There are going to be conflict for uh, orbital space, radio frequency spectrum, which is going to be utilized by everybody. There is a fixed spectrum, so everybody will fight for it. Technological readiness levels, rapid replacement and capability. Now, these are considerations for space. And uh, impact of the space conflict would be, if the conflict takes place, that means you are denying, you are killing somebody's satellite, or you are denying somebody's satellite, that means you are disrupting his communication. You are disrupting his surveillance and intelligence gathering capability. You are disrupting his navigation capability. Or he is not able to do what is called the situational awareness on the ground and air using the space object. That means he has, you have, whatever space superiority he had, you have denied him. So it will have tremendous impact in the warfare as, as well as in the civilian time because we are dependent for our economy of space in a big way. We have uh, today remote sensing satellites, surveillance satellites, which are really telling us how much of the crop has been grown there, how much is in, how much is the cultivated area and so on. So this is a major issue of space warfare. And like we have territorial uh, warfare, we have air warfare, so space warfare is going to happen. The kind of weapons which will be used in the space warfare are space-based lasers. 
the space based interceptors and uh, maneuverable satellites a satellite which can be maneuvered as far as the demand is concerned now there are various methods which will be used like electronic jamming attacking sensors and uh, you know uh, dazzling systems you will be able to dazzle the satellites you can throw pallets against another satellite attack from the ground another anti satellite system and so on so this is the kind of thing that will happen solar power has been in the news for many many years renewable but we still have the issues of solar power not available throughout the day so space solar power is the answer dr kalam used to take this as a mission i don't know whether he talked to any one of you in iit guwahati whenever he visited but the fact remains solar energy is captured in space by large photovoltaic arrays and transmitted by a coherent microwave or laser beam to an earth receiver where it is converted into a base load electric power low intensity charging power or synthetic fuels and then it is carried forward advantage is solar intensity in the ground is one in the space is 1366 watt per meter square whereas in the ground it is only 1000 there is no night and day we have 24 hours and uh, there is no weather loss and so on so this has been done many times by many countries from 1970 but because the energy people and the and the space people do, don't work together so it has fallen through the cracks so far what is the requirement my requirement is that i should be able to launch large size satellites at a low cost today the cost of launching a satellite is almost about 30 to 40 thousand dollars per kg now if it has to be useful in the case of a, a solar a space solar power the cost has to come down to something like 500 dollars per kg and uh, that would need new kind of launch vehicles what we call as a single stage to orbit reusable launch vehicles or two stage to orbits uh, with increased mass fraction today a typical rocket um, uh, launch vehicle will not carry more than 3 to 4% of mass fraction that is payload is only about that much we need to go it to about 15% and that means our engines which we are using today with a high uh, multi uh, propellants like bipropellants and so on will have to depend more on the air breathing engines and hence air breathing engines can work only in the atmospheres but it should be using a specific impulse as high as 1500 uh, seconds so you need to go for a scram jet kind of a system where you will be traveling at speeds of 6 to 7 or 8 max so these efficiencies have to be increased and that's a new technology the materials for aircrafts also are going through a transformation nanotechnology is coming up in a big way for both performance enhancement weight reduction reduction in flammability levels development of stealth technologies and so on basically both for noise reduction thermal flammability performance improvement uh, new processes are coming like resin infusion processes and so on basically to reduce the weight of the structure and also making stealth now that is another area which certainly will transform as far as the air force is concerned i mentioned to you about micro mechanical flying insects this is another thing like pico satellites which is happening today micro vehicle there is a target today there are micro vehicles which are having uh, for example 440 grams uh, weight of a micro air vehicle which can last only for 10 to 15 minutes and objective is that we should be able to go for 100 grams and a 60 minute kind of a endurance i should have different kind of micro air vehicles are under development and that means the today's nano technology nano propulsion nano, um, micro mems kind of systems mems actuators all that will form as part of this u cav that means air aircraft which can carry unmanned aircraft which can carry rockets and missiles and payloads that's another technology which is really in demand today india is also venturing into developing our own u cav but i think a lot more is required to be done because it would require um you know, control guidance navigation which is done in a in a not from remote but all on board and um, using the today's computing power and today's controls in a miniature manner all this if we develop i talked about many technologies what is the effect it is going to have as far as uh, the nation is concerned whether those nine disruptive 12 15 disruptive technologies or what we talked of defense or what we talked of precision agriculture and water and security all that some sums have been done if we converge all this we can achieve 550 to 1000 billion annual economic impact which is 20 to 30 times of india's incremental gdp 
from 15 to 25. Provide 400 million additional people with access to quality health care. Have 300 million financially included people. It will provide 14 to 24 million workers more years of education. Achieve 15 to 60 percent yield improvement for 22 million farmers due to precision agriculture. Save 50 to 95 billion uh, from energy technologies. Gain about 17 to 25 billion dollars from intelligent transportation. And create jobs for 10 million tech enabled workers in healthcare, education, agriculture, citizen services, and in financial services. So, friends, to end, I would like to only say that with this much of advantage, if it is there, obviously we are not going to be the only people to do this. The world is in a race between implementing ever increasing ways to improve the human condition and the seemingly ever increasing complexity and scale of global problems. Global collective intelligence, artificial intelligence and trans institution can help win the race. For us, that means we need to work together with the industry, with the academia, with the national laboratories, with all of us, bring synergies of action and thought, then only we can win this race of technology development and achieve these frontiers of technology. Thank you very much. God bless you all.